Well, good morning, church family. It is great to see you guys here today. I'd like to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me in turning to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5, and I'm glad to tell you once again today it is not over because Jesus died on a cross and three days later rose again from the dead. We have the joy of new beginnings in our life. He is not finished. He has a big work to do in your life and in my life. And in this series in which we're involved currently, we're considering and confronting those moments in our lives where we think it's over. Those times when kind of the storm clouds blow in, our view of the future is is clouded to the point that we can't really see beyond where we are and we're tempted to think it's over. This is where it stops. And and, uh, we learned last week that pain comes to all of our lives. But God has a purpose in our pain. He can use all things to work together for good. And so uh, pain comes, but God has a purpose in our pain. His purpose always involves a process. God's always leading us and guiding us. And the process of God, it always involves preparation. Because God is never about where you are right now. It's where you're going to go in the course of your life. And that preparation is always very personal. It's a personal God working with you in a personal way. It always comes back to Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him. It has always been and always will be about Jesus. And so this entire process goes full circle to bring us back to God. Today we're going to consider a man in the Old Testament who had the ultimate it is over moment. I mean, it was a moment that forced him to look at the facts and come to the conclusion this is it. Future is is done. It's never going to be what it could have been. It is over. And we're going to see that this man that we'll study today was a very successful man. He was powerful. He was prominent in leadership. He was wealthy. But he had a problem that led him to believe that life as he had known it was over. And, And the news that he received that led him to believe that was the worst news you could get in the time in which he was living. His problem was that he had been diagnosed with leprosy. Leprosy was not just a death sentence. It was a slow, agonizing, uh, isolating type of a death. It was the worst news that anyone can receive, and that's the news that this man received. But in the course of dealing with what he perceived to be the ultimate defeat, he learned that God could change our lives in ways we would never expect. In fact, he came to discover, were it not for the needs we have in our lives, we would never know that God could meet them. And sometimes God in His kindness and His grace and His love for us will allow us to encounter moments where our visceral reaction is, it's over, so that as we grow in God, we can come to the point where we say, you know, I know something now I didn't know then. It is not over. God is doing a work in my life. Uh, Listen, I am so excited to bring this message to you today. One of the best things about having multiple services is I get to preach more than once on a Sunday morning, and... uh, This message that I'm going to share with you, God put this thing in my heart for me. It helped me. I can tell you in the first service, people were saved, decisions were made, it made an impact. Now, that's the result of God, but we've got to cooperate with one another to say, today, let's get in the book and let the book get in us, and let's be guided by the truths that we glean today. And I'm just convinced what we're going to study in God's Word today can bless everybody. It doesn't matter where you are. What we'll cover is for every single person. And so if you're able today, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing. If you're glad to be in church, say amen. Amen. Great early service. I told you that. We had a great starting point, get together, had an opportunity to be in there. We're just having a fantastic day. So we're going to be reading in in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 1. And the Bible says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Now, I'm going to read on here, but we're introduced to the character we're going to study. He's a man by the name of Naaman. The Bible tells him a lot of great things about him. 
And then it concludes verse 1 by saying, but he was a leper, and that was the ultimate bad news. And then we're introduced to what the Bible calls here a young, a young maid. And uh, this was a captive living in the land where Naaman was living, a young Jewish girl. And uh, she hears of this leprous, leprous condition that Naaman has, and she begins to speak about it. Never underestimate or devalue the influence of any person, even a young person, who speaks up for the truth. And uh, I'm grateful for what she said. Now, I want you to turn ahead in your Bibles, if you would. We'll pick up our reading in verse 9. The Bible says there, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha is the prophet of God. In verse 10, the Bible says, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought... He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all these waters of Israel? May I, may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My, my father, if, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth. But in Israel, now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he, sa but he said, as the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. I want you to look back into the midst of verse 15, if you would. And there's just a few words there that are so encouraging to me. Naaman endured all that he endured, went through all that he went through. And I love that in verse 15, we find these three words there near the midst of it. Now I know. Let me tell you what we find in Naaman. We find in Naaman a man who encountered an incredibly difficult time in his life and he thought it's over. And the process through which God led him brought him to the place where he comes to know God. And he says, now I know it's not over. It's just a new beginning. God's doing a work in me, and uh, I want us to think on, on this together today. Our Father, I'm very grateful to be in this room with these people at this moment, and yet, Lord, unless you're working in our midst, we'll spend some time together, and that'll be the extent of it, but I really believe today that you can uh, help someone come to know you who doesn't know you, and you can liberate those living in a, in a form of captivity. God, you can do these things, and so we're looking to you today. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I doubt anyone in this room is going to get a phone call anytime soon sharing that you have leprosy. But we're all going to have some calls that we'd rather not have. You know the calls. I know the calls. The kind of calls that come in and immediately there's just a sense of emptiness in the pit of your stomach and awareness that it's going to be a rough day, maybe a rough, a rough patch of time. And, and uh, sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's an email you click on and you read something you wish you could unread. Maybe it's that conversation you had with that person and things were said that lead you to believe it's, it's over. Maybe it was that letter that you read that changed things. Or maybe it was the slip you got that was pink that put you you into a, dis, a, a time in your life where you thought at my age and my stage of life, you don't recover from a pink slip. This is it. My hopes for the future, they're diminished. It's never going to be what it could be. It is over. Maybe it was a financial uh, a ba a ba backstep in your life, or maybe it was a prognosis that was bleak, or maybe it's in the marital relationship and you're having differences and you're wondering, are these irreconcilable differences? I'm talking about those moments in life where we think it is over. Naaman would have been as down as any person could possibly be. You see, for leprosy, there was no remedy. There was no treatment. There was no hope. And when he heard those words, you have leprosy, he would have thought it is over. But you have to love the way the Bible introduces this little girl in the text. 
The Bible just calls her a little maid. And in Naaman's Syrian household, there was a Jewish girl who'd been taken captive who was there primarily as a servant to Naaman's wife. And there's no record anywhere that anyone asked this little girl what she thought about Naaman's condition. But she was bold enough to speak truth into the life of another person. Friends, let's not be the kind of Christ followers that hide our light under a bush. This little girl did the only thing she could do. She shined bright for God where she was placed, even though it was a difficult place. And she said, I, I, I know something. She said this. She said, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. This little maid says, boy, that's terrible what I heard about Naaman. If only he could get to the prophet in my home country, that prophet would heal him by way of the power of God. Well, when she said that, it happened what often does. That statement got legs and it began to run around the palace. And finally, that statement got all the way to the ears of the king. And the king didn't want to lose Naaman. Naaman was a good one. That's like the highest compliment I can give anybody. You're a good one. Naaman, he was a good one. He was a great man in the kingdom. And the king didn't want to lose him. And he heard what this girl said. And certainly he didn't know if it was entirely true, but he thought it's worth a shot. We have no options here. And so the king gives Naaman a huge sum of money to go back to Israel to seek for a cure. Now we know the end of the story. The end of the story is Naaman was healed. His skin was so clean that after it was healed, the Bible says it was like unto the flesh of a little child. It was such an amazing turn of events. You see, God saved this man from dying. But more than that, and I want you to hear this, God saved him from living an empty life. There are worse things than dying physically like remaining alive and whiffing on what it is God put you on this planet to do. But more than that, God also saved him to eternal life. God did an incredible, incredible work. As we consider how this unfolded, we see some lessons that can help all of us with, with all of our lives. Listen, you're, you're here today perhaps and you're dealing with a massive issue. And it may be that your visceral response and you're struggling with it is to, is to say, you know what, it looks like it's just over in that part of life. Uh, maybe you're dealing with something today that seems a bit manageable, but it's growing and you fear where it may be headed. What we find in this passage today is a clear roadmap to victory. And so let's look together in these verses. And if you have your notes nearby, uh, I'd encourage you today to jot this first lesson down. Here it is. We must be candid about what is covered. We must be candid about what is covered. Now let's go back to the beginning of this chapter to get a better picture of Naaman. Let's go back to verse 1. And I want you to look to this verse and see it with your eyes. For the Bible says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. So let's understand, Naaman was a man who'd done very, very well for himself. He was an asset to his king. He was a leader in the military. He was a powerful warrior, no doubt very, very rich. But what I want you to see, whatever he needed, it was covered. What do you need, Naaman? We'll cover you. We'll take care of that. Considering the Bible tells us that he went with 10 changes of clothes on this trip, Naaman was the kind of man who when he walked in a room, he commanded attention. You noticed. I mean, it's just that thing that we don't all know how to put our fingers on, but we know when somebody has it. Naaman was large. He was in charge. He was the commander of the entire military. He was known, and we certainly get the picture in this passage of Scripture, that he was the kind of a man that image was very important to him. How he looked, what he saw in the mirror, what he thought others saw when they looked at him image was important not only were all his needs covered when he expressed them he would have worn a covering as a leader in the military now I know we live uh, just a few miles away from the front gate of a marine uh, base and I, I will now give my unbiased unfiltered opinion about which branch of the military I think uh, looks the best in their dress uniforms it is the marines hand down all right and that's just my unbiased opinion but uh, at any rate uh, I, don't, I don't know if marines like to wear those all the time but I have talked to some guys that have said you know it is nice every now and then to get the dress blues out it makes me feel good and, and again I, I can't relate completely to that culture but it, it might look nice to 
uh, get in your dress blues and, and look there. It might be nice if in the course of a career you add some stripes that mean something to you. It's not just what it means to others, but it's kind of validation. Paid my time. I, I was promoted. I, I worked hard. Maybe some awards and medals. And, and all of that would mean something. And there is a sense of prestige. I don't care if you just graduated from boot camp and, and you're just standing there at the very smallest, lowest rank you're ever going to have in the course of your military career. There's credibility that comes with even wearing a uniform like that. Now, Naaman was not just in the military. This was a man that commanded the entire military. He would have had the most elaborate, decorated uh, outfit of anybody that would have covered him when he walked around. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how much you've done, or how much you have. At some point, you walk in a quiet home and you make your way to possibly an empty bedroom into a closet. It was long ago. There weren't light switches, probably one of those chains hanging from the ceiling. So he had to do it back then to get the light on. And, and in the private moment with just himself and his covering, he had to take it off. At some point along the way, Naaman would have thought, man, is that, is that leprosy? Man, I hope it's not. I'll keep an eye on that. And continued to watch, and at some point the, the fear is turning into an awareness. I, I think that's probably what it is. And he would cover up, and he would still walk in a room and get the respect that, that he wanted. He would still get that validation. But as he would cover up, at the end of the day, he would have to come back in the room, and he would have to take that covering off, and it would reveal a problem deep in his life that was literally eating away his life. Now, I have found that we all can be a bit like Naaman in this regard. We are experts at covering covering up those areas in our lives that we would rather others not see. We're experts at hiding from others those areas where we don't have it all together, and we are great at covering up. But at the end of the day, a breakthrough will never come in our lives until we get candid about that which we are covering. Those things that we want to hide in our private lives, they have a way of coming out in our public lives. The key to victory is not in hiding those areas in which we have a need. It's in being honest. We must be candid handed about what is covered. God in Numbers 32 said this, be sure your sin will find you out. Paul in Galatians 6 wrote this, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. Friends, hiding is a poor solution when we have a need for a breakthrough in our lives. Now, I am not advocating today that we hang all our dirty laundry in Grand Central and, and, and just put it on the front pages of, of all the papers, but I want to be clear. Victory, he, victory will not come if you don't acknowledge there's a battle in your life. It won't come. You're not going to get over it. It might as well be over if that's how we're going to handle adversity in our lives by becoming reclusive and withdrawing or, or putting on a covering so we think that people think differently of us than we know of ourselves. You'll never have victory if you don't acknowledge there's a battle. And God in his love for you has placed you in a place where there are those around you that want to love you and help you and support you and encourage you. And in the day in which we're living, I believe this, the church is God. God's idea and it's the will of God that every one of us would be a part of the body of Christ and if you're a Christian a Jesus follower and you don't have a church family find one fast now I'm impartial to coastline but I know it's not God's will that everybody come here I mean I, it'd be nice if, if a bunch of people did but but if you're like well coastline's not for me well good for you then you go find your place there You see, God created this institution we call the local church as a place where we can be candid about what we try to cover. James, the younger brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, said it this way. He said, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, listen, friends, no one can pray for most of the needs in our lives because we don't want to admit to anybody we have a need. We're, we're too interested in trying to put on. We put on this cloak of, of personality and we, we try to convince people that we're something other than what we are in reality. And God says, no, 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 there are people in your life. That person may be a brother or sister in Christ. It, it might be a small group leader as we heard about today. It, it, it might be a counselor. Sometimes God can even use a spouse 
spouse, the person we're married to, to look into our lives and to help us. But we've got to be candid about that which is covered. Almost three years ago now, Lisa and I were on a plane and we were traveling and that trip was on the heels of a season where I was feeling very empty. I've talked to our church about that. Uh, maybe just a little bit of fatigue. I don't know what all it was, but I was just discouraged. And it seemed as though I was going through motions. The, uh, the, the heart of it all wasn't what I wanted it to be at, at all by a long shot. I just was empty. Everything was more than I thought I could do. Every person in my life was a drain. Every, every little request was just like, oh, no. And and, and I knew I was in a season that wasn't good. I mean, I've, I've lived enough and known enough to know that when those moments come, man, that's not the time to cover up. You're only as sick as your secrets. So here I am sitting on a plane with my wife, and I, I shared with my wife that for months I'd been feeling this way and going through this. And, and when I shared that, here's what my wife said to me. She said, Steve, I never knew. And that's when it happened. That's when I discovered how I can excel at lying to people, people that love me, the person on this planet that knows me better than anybody else. I sleep in the same bed with her. I live in the same house with her. This person knows me better than anybody. And after months of feeling that low, my wife said, Steve, I had no idea. And I would imagine you're as good as I am at covering up. But when I opened up, man, she spoke love and affirmation and grace and truth into my life. What a shame I had to go months without the very words I needed because I was more interested in covering up than being candid about that which I had covered. Friends, here's the statement I want you to take home today. Those areas where you're covered are often the areas in which you're conquered know that. Oh, I just can't seem to get past this area in my life. Well, if, if your biggest job is to cover up, you're going to be conquered. What I keep covered keeps me conquered. It's worth noting that this happened to a man. The, the Bible tells us of Naaman. He was a great man, an honorable man, a mighty man. Who are we to think that we're not allowed to have problems? we got to try and hide that for fear someone will realize we're not as awesome as our Instagram posts make us out to be. I thought I'd preach on Instagram since I don't have it, okay? And, uh, but, but we try to perpetuate this image of, hey, look at me, got it all together. Listen, Naaman was an excellent human being. He was great, honorable, and mighty. But you know what I've noticed? This is, this is helpful. Sometimes our strengths become covers for the areas of the greatest need in our life. I mean, Naaman was great and honorable and mighty, so he could bring his greatness and his honor and his might. None of that was going to erase the fact that he was a leper. A leper. What we think are assets can become the greatest deterrence to the alterations that God wants to make in our lives. Victory begins when we get candid about what we've covered. Here's a second thought. We must eliminate all of our expectations. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. This is helpful. I, I like this point too. I like the first one too, but I like this one. Now, when Naaman finally made it uh, from the king of Israel's palace to Elisha, he was given a command. It was not what he expected. It was not what he expected. Um, in fact, Elisha didn't even speak with him. He sent a messenger out, which would have ticked a guy like Naaman off, you know. Like Naaman's, I mean, no one had to tell Naaman he was important. He thought he was important. And he comes to see Elisha, and Elisha's like, you know, sending a guy out to talk to him. And the command was very, very simple. In verse 10 of our text, the command was this. Go wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Jordan. Go to the Jordan River. Go to the Jordan River. Dunk yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Um, about eight, eight or ten years ago, Lisa and I went to Israel together. And it was such an impactful trip for me. Did you know when you're in Israel, you're not any closer to God than you are in Oceanside? <laughs> Sometimes I hear people go to Israel and they're like, I just felt so close to God. And it's like, you're, you're actually not any closer. He walked right there. I know, he lives right in here. You don't have to go there to get close to God. From the standpoint of a Bible student, it was overwhelming to me just to put it all together and to look at the various places. And I, I'd like to go back one of these days. I was so overwhelmed the first time I was there, it was kind of hard to take it all in. How many of you guys want to go back with me? Anybody go back with me? All right, we'll do that in 2020. That'll be good. But uh, at any rate, so Lisa and I, we're, we're in Israel, and uh, oh, just amazing. And uh, 
we were driving over to Capernaum where Jesus, the majority of his uh, earthly ministry was based out of Capernaum. And, and uh, just north of there is uh, uh, a place called Caesarea Philippi. I'm just throwing out random names now that I learned because I went to Israel, you know. Uh, but we're driving around this area. And as we drove through there, we went over what looked like a little irrigation channel. And uh, our, our guide said, oh, that's the Jordan River. And I was so disappointed. I'd read about the Jordan River all my life. I mean, it's like all through the Bible. And uh, I was so disappointed when I saw it with just a little muddy thing. And I'm thinking, good night. This is the river like the children of Israel could not cross. I'm thinking, I could hop over this thing, you know. And now, there's 9 million people living in, in Israel that are drinking uh, out of their water supply. So it's gone down a little bit. But what I learned is, near this place called Caesarea Philippi, it's at the base of a mountain called Mount Hermon that gets tons of snow. And in the spring, that snow melts. And that's what fills up this river that flows into the Dead Sea. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's where they get their water. Um, but, but I drove over that and I thought, it, it's not like the Colorado River or the Mississippi River. I mean, I kind of thought this is going to be some grandiose, beautiful, pristine. It wasn't. It was just kind of muddy. Now, so Naaman's told, go dip in the Jordan seven times. And he wasn't happy about that. In, ver in verse 11, the Bible says Naaman was wroth. Wroth just means he was ticked off. And, and he went away and said, behold, I, I thought he'll surely... Listen, listen. Naaman said, I thought. I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand, strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. I thought he would come to me, that he would stand. I don't know what that means. He would stand and, and uh, uh, that, that he would call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand. And, and uh, uh, that, that was what he thought. Naaman had it all figured out. He thought, man, I've watched late night religious TV. I know how this works. You know, the, the man of God comes to me and then he stands, whatever that means. And then he calls on the name of the Lord his God. And he says, be healed or whatever he does. And Naaman says, I have an expectation. I have a problem. I'm coming to God. I know just how God's going to work in my life. It's going to be big and flashy and grandiose and special. And yep, not at all. Not at all how it happened. You know, Naaman's calculations almost kept him from a cure. The end of verse 12. So, so he turned and went away in a rage. Were it not for servants that said, hey, come on, Naaman. If he would have told you to do some big thing, you would have surely done that. Just... Just do this. Just do this. Verse 14 is a key verse in this passage. We read, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. I love that the Bible says, Then went he down and dipped himself. We're reading about a man who totally gave himself over to a process that he never imagined. He had to check his pride at the proverbial door and say, God... If you're saying to do this, that is what I will do. And friends, when God in his grace told his children how to recover, when they thought it was over, he said this in Deuteronomy 3. He said, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul. And you get the idea in this passage that Naaman just came to the point where he said, you know something, Lord, my expectations of how you're supposed to work in my life, I'm gonna set those aside and trust you. And friends, I want you to know something. If you just wanna dabble in the shallow end of truth, you will remain very much the way you were when you got into the shallow end. Naaman had to dip himself. I mean, he went down into the water. He dipped himself. He, he set his expectation of how it would go aside, and he just took the plunge. And listen, sometimes as Christians, we had a rough patch. And, and as Christian people, you, you would think we have a proper theology of God, but oftentimes we don't. And sometimes when we hit a rough patch, we think, you know, uh, maybe I could use God in this situation. And so we think, you know, what I need to do maybe is a bit more. A bit more. I, I need God's help in my life here. And, and you know, I, I haven't been given in the offering like I should. And so maybe I'll do a little more of that. Or, I, you know, I miss Sundays every now and then. And, and may, I'll start coming more regularly. Or I'll serve. Or I'll do this. Or I'll do that. And we think, you know, I'll, I'll do a little bit. And then God will look at that which I've done. And God will say, 
look at what you've done, you know, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you in this way. And we, we think if we can just outstructure things just right, that, that we're going to get God's attention. And I'm telling you today, we cannot work our way into a good standing with God. It never works that way, which is why the Apostle Paul in Titus 3 and verse 5, uh, he, he wrote this, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You don't negotiate your way into mercy with God. You don't say, God, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. I want to barter these things for a bit of your mercy. No, mercy comes when we say, God, mercy. I can't do it. I don't have what it takes. The best I can produce is inadequate, God. I humbly come to you. You see, for Naaman, his faith was demonstrated by his obedience. I'm going to say something that's going to seem harsh, but it's true, and it applies to me too, so I'm not being unkind. Don't say you believe the Bible if you don't live it. You do not. You know? Now, I understand we're not perfect. I, I get it, but our beliefs are determined by our behavior and vice versa. You, you, you can tell a lot about where you're at in your faith life by the respect you have for the Word of God. I felt like everybody got mad at me right there. <laughs> There's a joy and a peace that comes to our lives when we just say, God, whatever your Word says, that's what I want to do. And when we don't, we quickly and readily admit, God, my bad. God, you're never bad. That was my bad. I'm going to get back to what your word says. I love the way David said it. He said it this way. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Hey, God, as you bring to light stuff I don't know, I'll do it the way you say. Just teach me. And God, that implies I want to learn. I want to be a student. So God, as I'm growing in this thing we call life, as I'm growing in my faith, God, as you, as you teach me stuff, help me just to be the kind of guy that as you teach me, I put it to work. And God, I want to do this for, for all of my life. Victory doesn't come when we come up with a crafty plan and try to find a way to manipulate God into participating in our life. You say, God, I'm in a mess. Help me out. Could it be that God gave you that mess so that you would turn to him, not just for a helping hand, but Turn to him in faith. What we need to do is have the spirit of Christ who in the garden before being crucified prayed, not my will but thine be done. Put our expectations aside. Naaman had to come to a place where he thought, man, I had it all figured out. I thought, here's how it was going to go. I mean, I'm me. The prophet's got to come out and he's going to be really respectful to me and it's, it's going to be flamboyant. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. And it was the opposite of what he thought it would be. That leads us to the final thought today. I want you to see he had to be open to a deeper discovery. Naaman did well in uncovering that which had been covered. We've all got to do that. What we cover keeps us conquered. So he did good. He, he uh, uncovered what had been covered. And uh, he came around and even did well eliminating his, his expectations. But, but he went home a changed man in more ways than he had anticipated. And and sometimes we learn in life that what we thought was our problem was actually a symptom of a deeper issue, right? Sometimes we'd say, for example, boy, I've got an income problem. And if we'd really analyze that, it might reveal that, now you can't have an income problem, but sometimes we could say, I have an income problem, but if we really analyze that, we'd say, no, I got an expense problem. I just spend more than I make, right? Right? And if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. That's true for everybody. Nobody's special in that mathematical equation. So we'd say, i got an income problem. And you can't have an income problem. Sometimes we'd say that, and the issue is we just spend more than we make. Sometimes we'd say, I have a communication problem in my marriage. And it very well may be that one or more people in that marriage has a, 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 a grief a beef, a problem with the other person, and little bitterness has, has grown in, and, and so we've distanced ourselves, and there is a lack of communication, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is a bit deeper. There's just something else we got to work through. And, and Naaman came into this area thinking, I've got a leprosy problem, and God said, you don't even know your problem. You think you need new skin, God said. 
No, you need a new heart. I love the way we read of this in Ezekiel 36. The Bible says, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I'll take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Listen, this was a man... Naaman, who worshipped pagan gods, he worshipped in the house of Rimon, but in the course of dealing with his problem, he made a much deeper discovery about the true God before he could leave town. He goes back to Elisha, and in verse 15 we read this, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God on all the earth but in Israel. And friends, that is all God wanted him to know. I remember years ago, I was finishing up college in uh, Tennessee. I'm a Southern California guy for the most part. I went to college in in Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, I attended a church there and served on staff. And I remember one day, uh, our church had visitation nights where we'd follow up on people that came to the church. One day I went on a visit with my pastor. And in all my time there, it was the one time we did it, and I was thankful for that. And uh, there was a young guy that had visited our youth group, and so we went to this home. And uh, I remember sitting there, and, and my pastor, he, just, he was so smooth, good with words. He's, he's just, you know, he was like everything uh, I'm, I'm trying to grow into in the course of life. Uh, I admired him greatly. And we went into this home, and as he's sitting there, uh, he asked the boy a few questions, just kind of small talk, and, and then he, he said something like, tell me your story. And the story was an incredibly sad story for a, a teenage kid. It was a story of a mom who died and a dad who was in, in prison and being passed around from family to family in Texas and not a fit and nobody really wanted him. They farmed him off to a grandmother in, in Knoxville and, and she brought him to church, which is how, how we met him and I'd heard of him and and uh, it, was, it was a horrific story. I mean, I didn't tell all the, uh, all the details of it. Now, I'm literally sitting there with tears in my eyes and a lump in my throat from what this guy's told us. And when he's done talking, my pastor goes, well, son, isn't God good? And I honestly was aggravated. I'm like, did you even listen to what this guy just said? There was nothing good about that story. Loss of a parent when you're young, a parent who's, who, who's in prison when you need that role model, that influence more than ever in prison, family members not wanting you, people pushing you from one place to the next, and then you get sent to a complete other state where you have no friends, nothing, you got to start your life over. There was nothing good about that story. My pastor's response was, well, son, isn't God good? He paused and then he went on, wasn't God good to send you to a grandmother? who would bring you to a church where you could now have a chance to hear the gospel and know what it is to be a child of God. He then took his Bible out and shared the gospel. About 25 minutes later, that kid bowed his head and he trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. That young man could have identified his needs in any number of ways, but what he most needed was that relationship with God and it was all that hurt in his life, if you would, that brought him to that place. You know, sometimes we think we need so many things when what we really need is much deeper. We need that new heart that only God could give. That young man I told you about his life was so tragic in so many ways, but my pastor was right. And that truth is true for us today, for all the difficulties we face in life. We we need to know that, that we have a heavenly father who can use all of those to bring us to the point like Naaman where we could say, now I know. I I thought it was over, but now I know it's not over. God's just working in my life. Naaman's entire dilemma was an occasion for him to know God in a personal way. And what is interesting about this fact is that if you were to study the Old Testament, and the Old Testament predates the birth of Jesus physically and his crucifixion and resurrection and all of that, in the Old Testament, Naaman, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better picture of salvation He had a disease that was going to consume him, eventually take his life. He couldn't cover it up. He couldn't deal with it. No amount of fame or notoriety would take it away. He had to come in humble faith and trust God for physical salvation. And similarly, we all deal with sin. 
It's, 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 it's a thing that we can't actually handle on our own. It will consume our lives and send us into eternity separated from God forever. And no amount of works will erase the debt that our sin has created. And we have to come to the Lord and say, God, I'm coming to you in faith. Would you save me spiritually from my sin? That's how God works in our lives. He can use those times when we hurt to bring us to one of those aha moments where like Naaman, we could say, now I know. I mean, I didn't know. All I knew was it, it hurt. But now I know. I would never want to imply that all the pain we go through in life is our fault. There are times when things happen to us and, and it brings pain. I've also had a lot of times, to be honest with you, where the biggest problem in my life was me. And I'm sure a lot of you would say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And there's nothing worse than looking in the mirror and the person staring back at you is the source of the biggest pain in your life at that moment. It's like, I cannot believe I just did that. Sometimes we cause our own pain. Sometimes it's just, life just happens. Somebody does something. Uh, that, that's the way it goes. Naaman tried all he could come up with to solve his own problem. But he had to come to the place where he'd say, God, I'm just going to be real with you. I'm not going to try and manage my image. I'm just going to be candid about that which I've covered. God, God, I'm not bringing you a suggested roadmap for my life of how things should be. I'm just going to have to set aside my expectations and say, what, what do you want for me? And, and we all have to come to the place where we just have to be open to a deeper discovery. A lot of times what we would call the problem in our life is, is an event. That whether we created by a bad decision or somebody else created through their wrong act, it, it can be an event of God's grace to bring us to the place where we would say, I didn't know, but now I know something I didn't know then. I've learned. I've grown. I've changed. This was a man who had an encounter with God and he went from saying it's over to it is not over. And that's something we all can come to. Our Father.